one of the more interesting folks in the communication field for a whole range of reasons, including two of his books that I would commend to you, Speaking into the Air, Courting the Abyss, obviously goes with the transparent title, uh, and the forthcoming Promiscuous Knowledge. I hope it's forthcoming. I'm sure it is. Um, for those in, in search of more immediate gratification, uh, I would uh, recommend a short piece that John just published in the uh, well-known International Journal of Communication. Available online, free, uh, anywhere in the world, uh, with the charming title Sweet Lemons, which was John's very interesting contribution to a discussion at uh, the opening plenary of the ICA in Boston last uh, spring on the topic of communication as the discipline of the 21st century, from which finish this sour topic of John and some <laughs> sweet lemonade. Um, John, I think, in particular, has been valuable by keeping a historical perspective uh, clearly in focus, one that I think the field of communication studies all too often uh, really misses, ignores, or, or forgets, and I think is really essential. And also one of the particular contributions of the academic field of communication, as opposed to all the other ways in which communication uh, intersects with our, with our lives. And I'm sure you will uh, experience that today. To give you a brief background, uh, John, uh, left Utah to uh, do his uh, graduate work at Stanford, and then returned uh, to Utah, but went to Iowa, where he has been ever since, uh, since uh, 1986. Wow, very good. And uh, is uh, here today, and will be around this afternoon. Some of you, I think, have arranged to uh, meet with him, but I think there's some, probably some free time still in the schedule that uh, can be arranged. Uh, if you wish, so I won't take Thank you. Good afternoon. I'm very uh, pleased to be here. Thank you for the nice introduction, Larry, and thanks for the opportunity to uh, uh, speak to you uh, today. I think we're incredibly fortunate to be alive in this time in which knowledge is so abundant and so ripe and so bursting. And um, I, I think the world is a very exciting and very troubled place for us to uh, think about that. Unfortunately, today I'm not going to talk about the world or probably knowledge. I'm going to talk about the, the, uh, the academy, and I'm gonna, um, which I usually prefer not to talk about. This is, I see, as a kind of antivirus software um, effort on uh, my part because the meme or virus of technological uh, determinism, as far as I can tell, has kind of uh, run amok to quite ill effects. Uh, in my opinion. And so the basic structure for my talk today, and I, I want to leave plenty of time for questions, is to start with, with some sort of larger claims about this term and about how academic debate works, and then give you a kind of quick and dirty history of the idea of technological determinism. Because I do indeed like to work historically, and I think that intellectual history is actually a tool of social criticism and can certainly be a tool of academic uh, clarification. And then I'll finish with some hopefully somewhat outlandish uh, uh, propositions that we can uh, debate. Mm -hmm. Technological determinism, or sometimes techno-determinism, is a notion in desperate need of a critical intellectual history and reappraisal. It is a doctrine more often attributed than advocated. The accusation, writes Jeffrey Winthrop Young, quote, frequently contains a whiff of moral indignation. To label someone a techno-determinist is a bit like saying that he enjoys strangling cute puppies. <laughs> the depraved wickedness of the action requires further, uh, renders further discussion unnecessary. Um, according to Wolf Kittler, teacher at Santa Barbara, uh, the notions of um, technological determinism goes around scaring students like a curse. Um, it serves more as a speech act to intimidate than as a heuristic guide. The, the charge of technological determinism nags the conscience of anyone who wants to study the role of media or technology in history. Few scholars feel that they can talk about technology without hastening to add that, yes, of course, people are involved. I'm not one of those awful technological determinists. I know there's social construction technology as well. 
Um, for my part, I'm tired of the ritual of compulsory populism. But whenever the patently obvious must be solemnly and predictably in, uh, invoked, thinking has stopped. Fear of technological determinism blocks the path to inquiry. In a moment when the meaning of technics is indisputably one of the most essential questions facing our species, do we really want to make it an intellectual misdemeanor to think big thoughts about technology, however ill-defined that, that category is? In, indeed, I think the very project of media studies, that is to show that form, delivery, content, ownership, structure, storage, transmission, you name it, that these things matter. Uh, our, our very field is jeopardized if technological determinism is always a curse. I'm not interested in defending a hopelessly muddled notion. The notion of technological determinism is itself a horrible mess, but rather in clearing away um, the, or in opening up the intellectual um, possibilities which technological determinism or the threat of technological determinism guards kind of like a bouncer at a bar. Um, and I mean, the ultimate point I'm going to make is that technological determinism um, invokes um, an ethically and metaphysically disastrous subject-object distinction, if that's, uh, if that's the kind of philosophical argument. But let's start with a, just a few rudimentary observations about academic argument. Um, we should note that technological determinism belongs to a long line and huge lexicon of academic insults. <laughs> At least since the term sophist was launched as a slur in ancient Greece, it has been a regular sport to contrive doctrines that nobody embraces and attribute them to your enemies. <laughs> Terms ending with ism serve this role particularly well. As Robert Proctor notes, quote, bias and distortion are perennial terms of derision from the center. And the authors of such slants are often accused of having fallen into the grip of some blinding ism. These isms are, are often things that no one will openly claim to support, such as terrorism, dogmatism, nihilism, and so on. Okay, and, and obviously there are corresponding nouns, ending with ist, which correspond to these uh, horrendous uh, isms. But we have to note that not all ists are necessarily a pejorative, such as artist, economist, pianist, psychologist, and above all, of you know, the greatest term of praise scientist. Uh, Proctor further notes that ism often designates zealotry or in imprudence in the realm of method. <coughs> we use words like uh, economism, fetishism, formalism, physicalism, positivism, and scientism, with reductionism standing in for the uh, whole group. Technological determinism belongs in, in this company as a name for a sin of over overemphasis. Um, it's often, it, the, the, the kind of rhetorical situation is often where people will practice gotcha, kind of like, you're a foul logo and you didn't know it. I mean, it, it. It's often like racism or sexism, these <coughs> are, which are often charged against people who don't realize that they are uh, uh, perpetuating them. Okay. The second point, I would say, is that technological determinism brings with it a long shadow of Western philosophy. A very complicated debates, first in theology, then in physics, about the nature of causality, which we're not going to get into in, uh, in any depth. It is interesting in the 19th century that the opposite of theological determinism, a la Calvin, predestination, is called voluntarism, which will anticipate the kind of cultural studies argument that people's agency gets robbed from them illegitimately of one thing technologically, in a technologically uh, determinist way. Third, at its invention, technological determinism meant something very different from what we take it to mean now. Technological determinism as a concept was invented in the 1920s and 30s. It was almost solely a concept within history, economics, and sociology until the 1960s. So 20s to 60s is the first period of technological determinism. The number one figure who represents technological determinism in this period is Thorsten Bedlin. Everybody says that uh, Thorsten Bedlin is the example of a technological determinist. If you look at Bedlin, however, things get to be a little bit tricky because his conception of technology is agnostic between craft and skill on the one hand, these things which, which seem to be sort of you know, actor networky kinds of theory things where, where people are, are, are practicing in systems, and um, machines and systems, artifacts, um, you know, gears, circuits, motherboards, uh, things like this. Basically, uh, Devlin tried to transmute 
the German notion of Technik into English. And his notion of technology was an effort to translate the work done in German philosophy of technology, which had been done by a whole variety of people. I think perhaps the most important and completely forgotten is Werner Zobart, um, a sociologist who really in many ways is the uh, German Veblen, um, who actually wrote a really brilliant essay 100 years ago, if you read German, I recommend it to you, called Technik und Kultur, which basically spells out everything, technics and uh, technology, however you decide to translate that, and uh, culture or civilization. And so um, for Veblen, the key thing about technology which makes it different from craft or skill is that science is involved. And, and, and the modern technology in Veblen's uh, understanding involves practices and knowledge. So the, the uh, kind of tired pun that's been around for 50 years of technology with a K in there, like knowledge and uh, technology is very much actually to the point of, uh, of uh, Veblen's um, understanding. Veblen loved engineers. He thought that they were, were the drivers of, uh, of uh, history in many ways. Okay. Um, it's also important to uh, point out that these, these questions about technology and the question of who's driving history is a huge concern in, in the new economic history done by people like Charles Beard, uh, James Harvey Robinson, and somewhat earlier, uh, Frederick Jackson Turner. And, and so there's a, a question about what drives history and the early period of technological determinism is always a debate with the ghost of Marx. I mean, it's very clear that there's a there's a, a, a question here about is it the means of production, is it ownership, is it technology? What is the thing which is uh, which is going in history? So, if we look at, at the first use of the uh, of the term, that is, if you believe Google Books, um, <laughs> and I mean, I can I can I mean, we, we can talk about you know methodological questions of what I'm calling, calling Martin Jay synoptic content analysis, because that's basically the, uh, the method that I'm, that I'm following here. But the first use of this term was 1925 at, by Harry Omer Barnes. Um, and this, uh, Barnes is one of the founders of the fields of history and philosophy of science in this country. He was a sociologist who had very unfortunate opinions about World War II, which we, which we didn't uh, talk about. But, um, <laughs> Actually, some of the most interesting theorists of technology seem to have really unfortunate opinions about me. A Martin Heidegger, perhaps one of the obvious, most obvious ones. Um, here's Barnes, quote, We are not, of course, arguing here for a theory of scientific and technological determinism such as Marx contended for. This would be an oversimplification of the historical process. Okay, notice a couple of things here. First is the, is the correction of Marx. Marx was wrong. We've got to fix it. And the second is that telltale, of course. Um, I mean, uh, I mean, this is uh, displays of conspicuous scrupulousness of being more inhibited than now, or more sophisticated than now, or pretty standard behavior for homo academicus. Um, and I mean, in the area of Barnes kind of saying, technological determinism, someone else does that. Someone who's I mean, and, and how people think that they can get away with saying, you know, they're smarter than Marx, I don't really understand. But anyway, um, but the, the key figure in really nailing down the notion of technological uh, determinism is the forgotten but very influential sociologist in his day, Robert McKeever, at, at uh, Columbia University, who built the Department of Sociology at Columbia and uh, brought together a triumvirate of formidable Roberts, Robert Merton and Robert Lynn, um, along uh, with, uh, with himself. And his, his book, um, Society, Structure, and Changes, first published in 1932, was uh, for years, for decades really, a kind of standard sociological treatise of, of sociological theory. And in this book, he says, Marx is an economic determinist, Devlin is a technological determinist. And it's, it's quite remarkable in the way that this notion is almost born fully fledged. Because when you listen to how uh, McKeever talks about technological determinism, he says, he defends, he says it's wrong, so we need to defend choice, we need to get away from extreme points of view, we need to recognize cultural diversity, we need to recognize contingency, we need to recognize that there's a close tie between economics and technology, such that you can't read economy off of technology or technology off of uh, economy, and, uh, and so on. Okay. So um, 
what, what's so odd during, during this period is that there are examples of figures in sociology who fit perfectly what we would now call a technological determinist position, but don't get called that. The best example is William Fielding Ogburn, uh, the sociologist at the University of Chicago. Here's a choice nugget from uh, 1940. Um, this is Ogburn. Technology develops, is let loose on society, sweeping all before it. Time on the clock of technology cannot be turned back. Technology rolls on like a huge tidal wave, while governmental structures stand like the rock of ages in a world of disorder. An irresistible force meeting an immovable object. And it's no secret if you know anything about Auburn that which one of those he thought should uh, give way. The stupid government should give way to this tidal wave uh, of technology. I mean, this is a clearly kind of technological determinist argument, but he doesn't get called that. Um, it's, it's, I mean, Vedler is, is, a, is a technological uh, determinist. Just a couple other examples from the uh, 50s. Alvin Goulder, uh, later much more famous, but also a, a Columbia sociologist, um, attacks Talcott Parsons in the, <coughs> the 1950s for being a technological uh, determinist, specifically for seeing bureaucracy as, quote, the result of technological change without inquiring into the motives and meanings which these changes have for the people involved. I mean, there it is. I mean, that's it's the same argument. The motives and meanings for the people involved. It's going to be a standard complaint about a uh, technological determinist argument. You also have uh, Hans Gerth, Hans Gerth, and C. Wright Mills in, in classic work, Character and Social Structure, from 1953, saying there is no automatic causal relation between the technological sphere and any institutional order. They're worried about unwarranted historical generalizations. Sometimes skills lag, they say, sometimes technologies uh, do. Um, but, then they, but then they talk about the notion of technological determinism, and they say there is something to it. And so there's, this, there's always this, this a funny dance where people want to you know, get close to technology and say, well, there's something really exciting and important happening here, but on, on the other hand, there's something that's making me really nervous about the potential of these ordinary <coughs> people to uh, be, uh, be uh, shaping. Um, now, just a couple little side, side footnotes that, um, as, as an interlude, the uh, French in, interlude that, um, as, as far as I can tell, the notion of technological uh, determinism is influenced from the 1960s on in, in Spanish, <coughs> Italian, um, and German by English language debate. But in French, in the 1940s, it's, in, it's, it's invented by this very interesting combination of the Anal School and the uh, uh, paleoanthropologist Andre Lois Goulon, who I'm totally crazy about. I've just uh, been out reading. I don't know if you know this cat, but very interesting. Um, and basically, technological determinism means for them an analytic method of looking at um, a kind of genealogical tree of technology, much like Darwin's biological method. It isn't this evil thing about where you strangle puppies or something. It's, a, it's, it's an analytic mode of understanding technology as belonging to a family. The USSR also, and Soviet sociology, um, fervently dislikes technological determinism in the 1950s. And as far as I can tell, they, they get the notion from Leslie White, um, the, the materialist anthropologist at the University of, of, of Michigan, who talks about te technological determinism in an enormously grandiose notion of a, of a technology. But it's quite interesting. Here's a, what is his first name? Um, Zvorikin, anyway, um, a, a Soviet technologist. His first name I cannot find says, um, the main fallacy in the theory of technological and social relationships widespread in other countries is just in this neglect of the social conditions surrounding technical development. Technological de uh, determinism represents an analytic failure to gr grapple with the real driver of history. So in, in other words, for the uh, Soviets, the problem with this is that technological determinism is replacing technology, uh, is missing you know, the, its, its economy. Which, uh, which drives everything. OK, so things start to shift in the 1960s. Um, one thing which happens is that the notion gets its first kind of full-blown philosophical articulation by the economist Robert Heilbronn, the classic article, 1965, Do Machines Drive History, in which he takes the notion of soft determinism from William James. And James is really dealing with determinism in an ethical and scientific context. And uh, Pyle Broder famously says, 
even is another quote, even where technology seems unquestionably to play the critical role, an independent social element unavoidably enters the scene in the design of the technology. The direction of technological advance is partially the result of social policy. So you, you can see that you know he's, he's, he's trying to figure out, I mean, this is the golden question ever since Marx. How do you do basic superstructure? How do you do structure and agency? I mean, how do you, how, I mean, how do you do structuration? How do you get all these things to uh, uh, fit, fit together? The other key thing in the middle of the 1960s is a certain Canadian. Any guesses? <laughs> <laughs> and this is actually very interesting because um, uh, somewhere in the 60s, in the late 60s, Marshall McLaurin replaces Thorsten Veblen as the poster child for technological uh, determinism. And you can see this as proliferation of uh, attacks on McLuhan as a technological determinist in the uh, 60s. And one of the first ones which I discovered, 1966, is very interesting because a member of our field, Phil um, McCormick, the great Canadian-American feminist sociologist and mass communication scholar, another Canadian, and uh, sorry, another Columbia PhD in sociology, who it turns out, and I know this through, through interviewing, and, is that she's, she studied McKeever's book. She didn't like McKeever. She had classes with McKeever. She didn't like him as a teacher, but she studied his, his book. And she's one of the first to call McLuhan a technological uh, determinist. So here's her language, 1966. Veblen, like McLuhan, underestimated our capacity to use technology without being influenced by it. Technological determinism, like all forms of determinism, is never able to cope with discrepancies. So I mean, here you actually, it's rare when you do intellectual history, which is famously like trying to nail jello to the wall. <laughs> that, 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 that you can nail down a text where you can see something so clearly shifting, but here it is with uh, Thelma uh, McCormick. It's, it's, it's quite awesome. But the real death blow, I mean, the real absolute annihilation of, of McLuhan as a technological determinist is in a text that I bet half or three quarters of people in this room have read. Any guesses? Absolute Destruction, 1974. Someone British. Rain Williams' book on television, where he just plasters. I mean, McLuhan got beat up by all kinds of people, but this is just a shellacking of the first order. Um, so um, let's just uh, I'll kind of review some of uh, uh, Williams' uh, complaints. McLuhan's apparently sophisticated technological determinism, determinism actually ratifies society and culture that we now have. His conception excludes social, cultural, psychological, and moral questioning and serves as a direct and functioning ideology. In his work, in McLuhan's work, this is William Still, the media were never really seen as practices. He desocialized and abstracted media operations. His technical abstractions have the effect of canceling all attention to existing and developing and already challenged <coughs> communications institutions. We can forget ordinary political and cultural argument and let the technology run itself. That's the kind of pastiche, Reader's Digest version of uh, Raymond Lane's uh, critique. But I mean, I mean, look, at, look at the charges. McClellan's a sellout, an idealist, a reactionary, a formalist, anti-historicist, foe of social criticism. The puppy strangler comes in. Okay, let me get a drink of water. Even better, or I mean, not quite as explicitly, but another key figure in in the seventies in shifting technological uh, determinism as not only analytically bad or stupid, but as morally dangerous and as catastrophic potentially for the human condition was William's fellow British Marxist E.P. Thompson, Edward Palmer Thompson, the great social historian. And in this period, the late 70s and 80s, one of the key campaigners for nuclear disarmament. And it's quite interesting in, um, in, in the ways that he talks about the bomb. I mean, I mean Thompson's anti-Bruno Latourish position could not be more clear uh, than, than this line, listen to this quote. As for the bomb, that is a thing. And a thing cannot be a historical actor. A thing cannot be a historical actor. Um, so um, Thompson goes on to, uh, to argue that, that the problem with technologically determinist thinking is that it reifies the problem into something inevitable, necessary, unstoppable, 
and that we we need theories and we need politics. And of course, for Thompson, I mean, it's, this is a, a, a key point in Western Marxism generally. Theory and practice go go together. We need theories and practices which recognize the uh, the uh, potential for agency. Let me read you a long sentence here because I, I mean, his prose deserves quoting at length. Um, Thompson says, to think of the arms race as inevitable is to follow an inexorable technological determinism of a kind for which historians, or at least I should say historians who I consider to be reputable, do not find any historical precedent. That is, some vulgar practitioners of determinism apart, historians do not find that technology or inventors unaided created industrialization or capitalism or imperialism. Nor can technology creep unaided bring us to extermination. Historians find rather a collocation of mutually supportive forces, political, ideological, institutional, economic, which give rise to process or to the event. And each of these forces exists only within the medium of human agency. The magic word, human agency. I mean, never was the critique of technological determinism put with greater urgency. The choice was clear, agency, extermination. Technological determinism was death, right? It's, it's kind of how it's all, how it's all lining up. Um, by the 1980s, it's, um, and things get, start to get really, really complicated. And, um, but you have all kinds of people who are piling on against technological uh, uh, determinism. A great example is Viva Baker, who you probably know as Weeby Biker. Um, who is a historian of technology who basically sees nothing less than democracy at stake, um, or what he calls participatory uh, decision making, in our ability to recognize what he calls interpretative, should be interpretive, flexibility. Because if we, we don't understand interpretive flexibility, we'll fall prey to determinist thinking. Feminist historians likewise in the 80s are calling for a recognition of the ways in which changing practices of housework interacted flexibly and sometimes surprisingly, sometimes antagonistically, with new, new domestic uh, technologies of vacuums, um, refrigerators, and most importantly, uh, telephones, where it's very clear we know from work of Claude Fisher, Lana Rockwell, and others about the important role that women had in actually transforming uh, tele telephone uh, practices. It, it's almost like you know, in the 80s, there's a kind of settlement that analyses that ignore popular pushback were complicit with oppression. That if you think if, if, if you're not going to foreground the role that people play in forming technologies and adapting, fighting back, pushing them, that there's something uh, potentially oppressive with your mode of analysis. So this is a really remarkable concept that can gather such a diverse company of critics. As we have seen, Soviet and East actually there's an East German Marxist Leninist complain about bourgeois technological determinism that neglects economic forces. Well, British cultural Marxists complained about Leninist economism that gives short shrift to agency. Um, in Commentary Magazine, uh, 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 New York Jewish uh, uh, intellectuals, soon to be neoconservatives, um, they complained in the 40s about technological determinism alongside Nazism. You have Christian anarchists like Jacques Ellul, who's who complains that uh, technological determinism is dangerous. I mean, he's, he says it's dangerous which is something I'm going to get to in just um, a second. How, how is it possible that one doctrine can be so absolutely hideous? I mean, look, at, look at some of its sins. Historical inevitability or perhaps fatalism. Lack of popular control over decision making. Autonomous technology. Denial of cultural contingency. The reification of technology into monolithic blocks. The overestimation of the power of engineers. The failure to appreciate the part played by people in the making of technical world, worlds. Uh, the term technological determinism required a number of barnacle-like adjectives. Crude, vulgar, naive, narrow, heavy, soft or hard. Didn't, don't quite have, have the same pejorative forms, but yeah. What, what kind of academic wants to be called crude? I mean, it, one of my friends, after hearing, hearing the version of this talk, said, uh, Reminded me of, of the essay called "Come Back, Vulgar Marxism: All Is Forgiven." <laughs> <laughs> Where did this unanimity of opinion come from? From across such diverse political and intellectual uh, positions, I mean, it's even more strange that the hosts of heaven 
would align themselves in battle against something that lies so centrally at the core of what scholarship or even cognition means, which is the drive to explain events by saying what determines what. I mean, if you're going to give up on determinism to some degree, if you're going to give up on some kind of analytic connection between variable A and variable B, you might as well give up on knowledge. I mean, that's a, that's a polemical claim that we can uh, discuss. But the, anyway, technological determinism, as it starts to evolve in the late 20th century, is something that, rather <laughs> like smelliness, is something that only other people possess. <laughs> so back to, back to uh, academic uh, be behavior. I mean, part of the, the uh, tricky thing here is that um, there are lots of scholars who will go on for volumes. Um, about you know the complexities of historical determination. Karl Marx is a great example. It's a lot easier to say that the handmill gives you industrial capital. I'm sorry, the handmill gives you the feudal lord, and the steam mill gives you industrial capitalism than to read Das Kapital. And so that you know that that very spicy little aphorism is going to say, oh, Marx, technological determinist, bad boy, and, and instead of you know having to actually do all do all the uh, the uh, work. And there's this kind of bizarre phenomenon in which very smart, very scrupulous scholars who will say that they are against technological determinism will then get accused as being technological uh, uh, determinists. So Marx is uh, exhibit number one. Um, and there, I mean, Devlin is another example. Jacques, Jacques Ellul, um, I, mean, I just discovered this a few months ago and it kind of freaked me out. He says, Quote, we sh this is in the Technological Society, 1964. Um, you know, famous work, which I've always kind of disliked because of its vaporous notion of you know, la, la technique. But he says, we shall need all the energy, inventiveness, imagination, goodness, and strength we can muster. Each of us, in our own life, must seek ways of resisting and transcending technological determinants. The ability to analyze the determinisms that press upon us is the very path to freedom. So there's Jacques Ellul saying that technological determinism is great Christian anarchist rah-rah call to uh, um, you know, action is something that almost any Marxist feminist uh, cultural studies person could um, agree with. Or James Carey, who often also gets called a technological determinist, will clearly say something like, and this is a, a quote from Carey, to think technology is something operating abstractly outside of history, outside of the political and economic moment in which it is born this is it, one of his very last essays, is to misunderstand both the possibilities and limitations of any given technology. And obviously, Kerry was very interested by a, by a technology. So um, I think one of the issues is we need to understand scholarship as an import-export um, business. And then when scholars export, that is when they write, they complicate and they qualify. But when scholars import, that is when they read, they reduce and they simplify. And then um, technological de determinism is a kind of byproduct of this funny smuggling business. Um, <laughs> because it's, it's such a kind of handy, I mean, instead of trying to figure out, I mean, what does it mean to live in a world of uh, industrial capitalism or post borders capitalism? And trying to do all that work, which is incredibly difficult, it's, ah, slogan. You know, there's a, there, there's a, 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 a certain kind, kind of ease in a, a doing this. Okay, so let me um, get, get to some uh, polemical conclusions and then we'll have uh, some uh, discussion. Uh, the fear of technological determinism, I argue, rests on an ethically and metaphysically suspicious subject-object distinction that can be disastrous for the study of techniques and technology to say nothing about media culture and uh, society. Uh, among his many slogans, Bruno Latour likes to say, Things are people too. I would like to add that people are things too. And um, we sometimes forget that our bodies are among the most mysterious things which possibly exist. I mean, we, we may have a certain kind of phenomenological transparency in everyday life, but when you're sick, you don't know what's going on. You depend, just like your car, you take it to an expert, and, and someone will poke around and listen and do expensive tests. And in, your body, in some ways, is profoundly alien to you. Um, our bodies, as we know through the study of a, you know, really fascinating, exciting stuff, recent evolutionary biology study of, of, of DNA, are just full of foreign objects. Mitochondria, 
are organelles which clearly were adopted into replicating cells as foreign little beasties. Every one of our cells, the furnace, is, is, is infested. I mean, so much of our DNA is, is, is paleo-virological. Bio, I mean, we've incorporated tons of, of prehistoric viruses into our, our, our DNAs. Chimpanzees, for example, incorporated the AIDS virus. We, we didn't, and for a, a disastrous reasons. Now, the idea that you can say um, technological determinism is evil because it makes it sound like we people are being encroached upon by technology denies the very fact that we humans are technical all the way down. We are technical all the way down. And in, in this I'm borrowing from uh, Andre Lavoie-Gouin. It looks like Leroy Gorham, if, if, if you want to try to find him. Really fascinating uh, book about skulls and feet and spines and hands and faces and teeth and showing the way, that our, the, the way that our necks are made, the way that it allows for a bulge of brain back here, the, the way that we are bipedal. That all of these are technical uh, innovations with very profound technical um, consequences. The freeing of the hand, which, uh, which allows us to intervene in the world in a way that lots of animals can. The, the fact that we have a facial uh, interaction with the world and a manual interaction with the world has all kinds of technical um, uh, consequences. Things can be alive, and people can be machines. Okay? These inalienable truths are obscured by the charge of technological determinism. Uh, the name of the game, th this is a Latour, a nice quote. The name of the game is not to extend subjectivity to things, to treat humans like objects, to take machines for social actors, but to avoid using the subject-object ob distinction at all in order to talk about the folding of humans and non-humans seems to me that the real crises that our planet faces and our field faces are examples where humans and non-humans are folded in various complicated ways. If you think about climate, if you think about disease, if you think about poverty, if you think about financial markets, if you think about basic questions of, of infrastructure, these are examples of you know, weird blends of nature and culture, subject and object. And to restrict our modes of analysis to those in which we can clearly see the stamp of populist action or the agency of, 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 of rebellious, romantic, uh, romantically rebellious individuals is to risk missing you know, a, a kind of urgent call, I would say, for macro level analyses. I mean, certainly, I, mean, I was trying to remember the uh, Jeep commercial. It's, what's the horrible slogan? We make machines, machines make us. Have any, have any of you seen this commercial? Um, floating around, um, you know, I mean, it is a, as if we humans were not machine-like, routinized web and network creatures, as if matter were blank nothingness, I mean, that's an insult to matter, as if our intentions and actions were transparent to ourselves, as if our bodies were not themselves technical systems, as strange and mysterious as the machines we use. Human being and agency should be a question we seek to answer, not a fact we uh, presuppose. So one more point. Um, in the end, all criticisms of technological determinism boil down to one thing, and that is don't confuse necessary and sufficient conditions. We need what one forgotten German scholar of law called a theory of the conditio sine qua non, the theory of the condition without which not, I mean, the, of, a, of a necessary uh, condition. To say that technologies make historical change possible is not to say that they cause it. The correct form of the argument is there is no A without X, but this does not mean that X caused A. Technologies induce possibilities. They do not constrain necessities. They are infrastructures, environments, contexts, and conditions that nourish and saturate the organisms that grow within them. Chinese history tells us all, all we really need to know. From around 1100 to 1500, China had a rich culture of invention, including capitalism, paper currency, long-distance seafaring, including the compass, watchmaking, gunpowder, and movable type, but for various reasons did not make those into engines of society direction. Media studies, it seems to me, communication studies, or generally should be the study of possibility, of conditions of possibility. This is the law and the prophets in media history. Necessary conditions are not sufficient conditions. Thank you.
let him talk and argue. <coughs> Hi, um, thank you. I really appreciate it. Uh, your lecture today. Um, so I have a question for Dr. So you're asking us not to, you know, 
not to kind of accept a reductionist way of understanding it, but to reject techno technology and determinism as reductionist categories. Oh, beautiful. Would, mm -hmm. Does that yeah. make sense? Yeah, much better than the first talk, yeah. <laughs> 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 much improved. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so, yeah. okay, I got it. Okay, so, yeah. um, so zero commits. Uh, yeah. And anyway, in relation to that, I was thinking of Daniel Miller's stuff that might be interesting for you, the social, where his thing, the meaning of stuff, and, and also apodurized social relations of things. So yeah. to take, I mean, the thing, that's, the thing that is so frustrating to me about Latour and people's, our objects, is exactly what you said. They're bumper stickers, right? They don't help us, and they're not productive in our thinking. If we would think rather about relations, you know, not people are things, things are people, something like that, but, you know, about, you know, Daniel Miller says that people, um, you know, one of his arguments is that people, um, the relations that we have with things makes us more human mm -hmm. and makes us oh. able to relate to others and, and, and kind of more human ways. And so to think of it that way also might be helpful. Anyway, right. I really enjoyed yeah. it. Thank, Thank you. you. Uh, yeah, I, was, I was wondering if you're sure we're not at a technologically determined moment. Uh, I've been reading Marx and thinking through uh, comparing the Industrial Revolution to the Information Revolution and uh, in a knowledge economy, in a sort of sector, yeah. a lot of institutions are transformed now to unskilled workers uh, if you're not writing code or, or dealing with the logarithms. Yeah. So, uh, uh, in terms of, of recover, uh, uh, recovering the idea of the, uh, some sense of determination mm -hmm. when you have knowledge revolutions right. that impact production, how would you, how would you read communication, or this, how would you yeah. study communication presently? Great question. Um, it, a couple of points. One is it's Heilbronner in 65 is very interesting because he says that technological determinism, both as a concept and as a possibility in the world, is a historically specific. Yeah. And, and then Heilbronner is a socialist and he says as long as you've got a mismatch between governance and production, you're going to have the problem of technological determinism because there's no real humane steering uh, of, of the system. I, I think that I agree with you that there is an important historical context for rethinking uh, determinism and determination in this moment. And that a lot of the criticisms of, in the 60s, 70s, 80s of technological determinism were the era of mainframes, of mass production, of uh, hydroelectric dams. I mean, Heidegger's always growing about hydroelectric uh, dams, broadcast TV, and in which populist, popular control were, uh, were very limited. And, you know, in a, in a day of, I mean, how do you want to characterize whatever this world that, that we're in, of loser-generated content or um, what, um, what, you know, bottom-up, dispersed, multiplex, what, whatever you want to call it. I think it's actually politically essential to start re-arguing for technological determinism. I mean, that might be the politically progressive point of view. When Time Magazine is saying, you are the one who's in charge of the world, <laughs> give me a phrase. I mean, <laughs> <laughs> so, let's start thinking about structure and system and determination and, 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 and power again. Yeah, yeah, the thing about communication is surplus value. Yeah. yeah. I mean, Google, I think we should all be really thinking and quite worried about Google, for, for example. It's, it's a really good example where we sh should be thinking about what conditions of possibility does Google make possible. It makes this, this lecture possible. Um, well, what, other, you know, what kind of price are we paying for, for that? Yeah. 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 I wonder if it yeah. also yeah. gets a little dangerous to go down the evolutionary biology, like psychology path, and that in some ways you could also say that was deterministic and sort of post hoc and improvable. Um, but when it comes to people as technologies, because I got the sense from you that it was yeah. mostly based on organic structures, like as in chemical yeah. elements. That, yeah. But at the same time, people incorporate the non-organic technologies as part of their bodies. People with implants, people, you know, you wear your wristwatch every time, um, yeah. yeah. Andy Clark and natural born yeah. cyborgs, yeah. that sort of yeah. mm -hmm. stuff. So how that plays into the humanist technology, but are some humans more technological beings than yeah. other beings? Well, well, thank you. I, mean, I, I just gave the little cardboard version of uh, the law of the law because he said, I mean, there's there's an organic history, but then there's the super organic history or the cultural history, in which human being and body and habitus and feeling and affect become. He doesn't say programmed, but you know, 
culturally speaking. I mean, these things are a condition of possibility uh, for me. Um, but I mean, to, to what extent am I determined by these things? And I would say they're a necessary condition for my being in, in, in the way of reading and writing are a necessary condition of my Dasein, you know, to uh, be re uh, really grand. But I mean, I don't think I can live without reading and, and uh, writing. But those are profoundly technical practices, artificial practices that had to be beat into me, which I still have to beat myself into doing. I mean, and it's not like talking and, and listening, which seem to be, you know, the language and instinct, Stephen Pinker's kind of kind of natural emergence. I mean, these are technical, difficult, hard things that you have to that you never master is, as any of you who've ever taught undergrads know that you know, 15 or 16 years in the training of the art and technology of writing is not enough. <laughs> so, yeah, um, yeah, I mean, I think you have to be, I mean, everything's dangerous. And, 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 but, so just because you, I mean, but evolutionary psychology is incredibly interesting. Doesn't mean you need to buy the whole kit and caboodle of, you know, the sort of weird scientistic nonsense that goes with it. But you can exploit and steal and borrow like that's what we're supposed to do, I think. <laughs> see, did I see someone over there before, Meryl? I guess someone. Yeah. So now you have Ray Kurzweil and his friends who with uh, judicious use of semi-log paper can graph out the improvements in information processing and communications and uh, predict that you know, in the next 30 or 40 years, we're going to be at the singularity point where the machines are going to be so much smarter and better than humans. So much more spiritual. Pardon me? So much more So does this, does this notion uh, fit into your classic uh, discussion of, of technological determinism? Well, I mean, the, the, um, the last I checked, people still die. <laughs> and, um, you know, I, mean, I I'm sorry that I just I, I don't buy that sort of you know age of Aquarius argument that um, you know that these light friendly technologies are are bringing us to the to the uh, singularity. I mean, Kurt, Kurzweil is interesting for uh, lots of lots of reasons, but people there's still backaches and bills and you know divorces and political troubles and Obama and. <laughs> you know, Netanyahu can't, can't get along. Maybe it'd probably be a better world if, if they could figure out how to, how to get along. I mean, how, how are you going to explain, you know, you know the, the old Adam, the persistence of the old human troubles in the midst of all this? And, uh, I, I don't want to go much further on this, but you, you know, there's the next step of saying, well, you put your DNA on the chip and you get yeah. rid of that. Right. But, but I mean, that, it, is this just, again, in the, in the normal flow of what technological determinism has been argued for the past uh, couple hundred years. But when you say this, oh, the, the spiritual machines, yeah. Yeah. Does, doesn't Kurzweil have a, have a kind of interplanetary network, intergalactic ne network? Like that 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 I, I don't know. Right. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, yeah, first, I don't think there's any such thing as normal history. And I, I think history is always abnormal, and every moment thinks it's, uh, it's, it's in a crisis. So I think it's very difficult to uh, kind of project. The only successful, one of the rare convincing exceptions that proves, proves the rule is Moore's law in you know, you know, technology. It's pretty fascinating how that actually has, has been borne out. But everything has limits. Everything has limits. Yes, that's what I'm trying to say. <laughs> <laughs> we all croak. Well, that happy note. <laughs> <laughs> In the short run, which is to say next week, right, we yes. will uh, hear from Christina Lerman from the Viterbi School of Engineering. She's a research assistant professor. Uh, will speak on dynamics of information spread on networks. Oh, that's perfect. No doubt. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's deterministic. <laughs> Her work, her work is primarily in, in uh, online communities. So those of you who are interested in that aspect of it, be sure to come because I'll, I'll tell you, it's got some really interesting data and results.